Uh, we're glad to have you with us this morning. And as we've already stated earlier, tomorrow is the 4th of July. It is a special day uh, for all freedom-loving Americans across our nation. We'll celebrate our 240th birthday as a nation. And uh, so we, we're getting older. We're not as old as some, but we're getting older. And uh, we're growing. And every 4th of July, we remember something that in 1776 was such a staggering event that it shook the entire world. Brave men had the audacity to declare their separation from the greatest military power of that time, but they went even further than just declaring their separation from England. They, they made an almost absurd statement for that day because they said that all men are created equal by God. And because of that, all men had certain rights. They had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now this was unheard of in the 18th century when status and power were determined by land, birthrights, titles, and wealth. But under divine providence of God, we decided that we were free to choose our own destiny. That within itself is remarkable, but then it became even more remarkable because we actually won the revolution. Nobody thought we'd win it, but we actually won the revolution. We said all men are created equal. They have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then we won the war. And we earned those things. And in our politically correct times of 2016, some historians are trying to rewrite our nation's history by questioning God's providence in creating this country on a biblical foundation for his glory. But I will say it loud and clear again this morning, do not believe their slanted views of American history. Don't believe the revisionists. Don't believe it when they take it out of your kids' history books. They're not even te teaching history now in most schools. Don't believe what they are saying. And let me say this, as Christians and as American Christians, educate yourself on what this country came from and how it was founded. And if the schools won't do it, and we know they won't do it, you teach your children, you teach your grandchildren, you teach your great-grandchildren what a great, blessed nation this is that we live in. Let them hear it from you if nobody else will tell them that. Don't believe the lies that are being told in the schools today. So for some of the men who were actually there during this time of our nation's founding, I just want to just tell you some of the things that they had to say about this. Now, many of you have heard the name Patrick Henry. And if you will just go down Route 220 South towards Martinsville, you'll come into Henry County, then you'll get into Patrick County, and that was all named after Patrick Henry. That's where he's from, just down the road from us. And it's all named after him. But he's most famous for this quote. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. He's most famous for that quote. We perhaps learned that in school. But Patrick Henry also said this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that reason alone, people of other faiths have been afforded freedom of worship here. So here's a man who was there at the founding who said, this was not based on religions. It was not based on anything else, but this country was founded and based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have to remember that. After the Constitution was ratified in 1787, Alexander Hamilton said this, for my own part, I sincerely esteem it, talking about the Constitution, as a system which, without the finger of God, never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interest. Hamilton said, I believe the finger of God was there to help guide this country from its beginning. Dr. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, said this, 
I do not believe that the Constitution was the offspring of inspiration, but I am as satisfied that it is as much the work of a divine providence as any of the miracles recorded in the Old and New Testament. See how highly they esteemed this document that declared our freedom and started us off as a nation. George Washington, in his first inaugural address in 1789, said this, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. Notice he's saying God was in our country at this very beginning, this very foundation. God was leading and God was directing. Many of us are so familiar with this famous sentence from the Declaration that we often take it for granted. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, if you've ever traveled outside of the United States, you can appreciate how freshly these words are applied once you come back into this land of liberty. We are a unique country. We are a country that God has inspired and used as a beacon of hope to millions and is graciously blessed beyond measure. But we are also a nation that is under attack. It looks as though daily the morals of our nation are crumbling around us. If you watch the news, you may be like me, and you may shake your head and wonder how far can our nation slide away from God. It was Abraham Lincoln who delivered a speech in 1838 in Springfield, Illinois, and he said that America's demise would not be from a foreign enemy, but it would be from within. And if we were to look around us today, it would certainly look like we are well on our way to destroying ourselves. But despite our blemishes as a nation, and there are many, because we are a nation who has been led by flawed human beings, despite all of those things, our godly ideals still shine across the globe to a tired and oppressed world that for many inspires them to a brighter future in America. And when you go to other countries around the world, they want to come to America. As bad as we think it is and as awful as we see our morals and all the decay around us, people still want to come to America. When I went to Indonesia several years ago, I was standing there and preaching to a group of young people, and I said, how many want to go to America one day? Every hand in the crowd went up. They all wanted to come to America. And no matter how bad it looks and how far we've drifted from God, people still want to come to this great nation. So do not be discouraged. We are still a God-blessed nation of hope, and we should be proud of our history of charity, liberty, and the freedom to dream. So be proud of that. And I know there's a lot of talk today about patriotism, and, and we shouldn't be patriotic, and we shouldn't talk like this. Well, listen, we still believe these things today. We still feel this way today. We still believe that God has blessed America. God is going to bless America. And we still have this patriotic hope inside of us that this nation will turn around and get back to God again. We still believe that. And so for the next several minutes, I want to talk to you about some things that have made this nation such a unique land of opportunity that has caused patriotism and pride in its people, and more importantly, why we should unashamedly associate God and patriotism so closely in America. First, I want to talk about our revolution. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. When we consider the idea of revolution, it almost always ends badly. If you are a history buff, you can think about the French Revolution. You can think about the Russian Revolution, the China Revolution. You can think about Cuba's Revolution, even the Mexican and the Cambodian Revolutions. Each of these ended badly for these countries and many of them are still suffering today because of those revolutions. Chaos, economic instability, 
death, and many other things mark those revolutions, and they end in murder and genocide many times. But when we consider the American Revolution, it's just the opposite. There are new freedoms, and there are new rights, and there are equality for everyone. And we have a remarkable document that is still the wonder of a democratic world. And all because I believe that God has ordained this nation to be birthed 240 years ago so that we can show his love and his values to the world around us. And truly, as we can see, by the leadership in the world that the United States has possessed, righteousness does exalt a nation. When nations get close to God, God gets close to that nation, and God exalts that nation. The same is true on an individual level. When an individual gets close to God, God gets close to that individual, and God begins to exalt that individual. Many Americans today are not familiar with the Frenchman named Alexis de Tocqueville. The Tocqueville visited America in 1831 to see how this democratic experiment was working after America's birth some 50 years later. And he wanted to see why America succeeded and what made America tick. He was so impressed by what he saw when he came over here, he went back to France and wrote a two-volume work entitled Democracy in America. And here's just a portion of what he wrote. He said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. In her fertile fields of boundless forest, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. In her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. And I love it. Here it is. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness, did I understand the secret of her genius and power? America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. What was he saying? He returned to France convinced that our faith in God was the engine of our liberty. I heard it in the pulpits. I heard the flame of righteousness. I heard the flame of godliness. I heard the flame of the gospel of Jesus Christ from our pulpits. And because of that, the Tocqueville was convinced that God was the driving force behind this great nation. And if we stop preaching the truth, and if we bow to pressure, and if we give up on the word of God and turn away from it, then God will no longer exalt this great nation of ours. The fire of God still propels us forward. And he said it is the engine to the greatness and their liberty. So let's talk about liberty this morning. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus said this. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Here's a simple definition of liberty. It is that we are set free from oppression, free to then choose, and that we are not coerced into making that decision. That's all liberty is. Liberty is I've been set free from oppression. I am now free to choose, and nobody has coerced me or made me make that choice. In colonial America, this was not the case. Great Britain determined our choices, which were decreed by a monarch thousands of miles away, namely King George and his soldiers who lived among us. This system oppressed the common man, and by 1776, the colonists had had enough and decided that we must throw off this British yoke. We must declare ourselves free and choose our own destiny. And in America today, liberty the meaning of liberty has changed. Liberty means doing whatever you want to do, whether it's right or wrong, as long as nobody gets hurt in the process. Liberty is simply doing whatever you want to do in America today. And I think we can see example after example of that definition of liberty being expanded around this country of ours. It is clear that liberty can be twisted and redefined, but true liberty is God's idea. So now let's look at liberty in a spiritual sense, and let's look at God's liberty. 
In Galatians 5, 13, the apostle Paul writes, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You're called to be free, but then he says this, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. In this scripture, Paul shows us a new level of freedom, a freedom that was never intended to be used for selfish purposes, but it was to be used for the benefit of others. When you think of America's charities and relief organizations and how we have assisted countries around the world, this makes sense, doesn't it? We have used our liberty, we have used our freedom to bless others around the world. America cares, and she shares her blessings with others in need. We've seen this repeatedly. Natural disaster after natural disaster. There's a telethon on the television. There's a fundraiser and drive going on. You can text money. You can, can Facebook money. You can give money. And hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars can be raised to send funds around the world to those who have encountered some type of injustice or some type of natural disaster. We use our liberty to help others for good. We've seen churches collecting items for the flood victims in West Virginia the last week or so. And what is that? We have liberty in Christ. We've been give, forgiven of our sins. We've been forgiven much. And now we want to take that liberty that we have and we want to bless others and try to help them in their time of need. But look at what Jesus says about true spiritual liberty in John 8. He says, to the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say then we shall be free? Jesus replied, verily, truly I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but the son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free... You will be free indeed. Amen. These are essentially the same ideas of liberty or freedom, but with a twist. Jesus is talking about more than just a freedom to choose. He's talking about the freedom and the power to freely choose to do what is right. Much like the Apostle Paul meant when he said to serve one another. I am choosing to do what is right. I choose. I am choosing to serve those who need to be served. Before an individual repents of their sins and accepts Jesus as their Savior, the Bible says that we are slaves to sin. We cannot do right because of the sin that is inside of us. But when Jesus sets us free, we now have the power to choose to do that which is right. God's spiritual liberty is different from our national liberty. It is not a license to choose only, but it is freedom to choose what is right. And the Apostle Paul lays it out in Galatians 5 when he says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In other words, it is a freedom to do what we ought to do. What is right, what is good, and what is moral. Christ gives us the power to choose to do right. And Paul says that is true liberty. You have the power to choose to do what is right. Now let's look at another virtue that our founding fathers wanted us to get. And that is the virtue of equality. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, and he says, For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. When Jefferson wrote, All men are created equal in 1776, it was a stunning claim. In fact, in Europe, it was the exact opposite. People were not equal. They were not free to state what they thought. They were not free to express what was on their minds, and this was a revolutionary idea. They declared that we are not in a caste system. There are no monarchs, there are no kings or dukes or earls. 
We are all to be treated the same in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of each other, and in the eyes of God. We are equal. We're equal. Can I tell you this morning that all of us here are equal in the eyes of God? We are. Unfortunately, we look at each other differently sometimes. We look at what people have or what they don't have. We look at their education or their lack of education. We, we tend to get caught up in the material things that people have acquired throughout their lifetime. And we judge people based on those things. But in the eyes of God, we are all equal. All of us. Before we come to him, we are all sinners. And he just sees us all as sinners. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, he sees us simply as his children. We're all his children. You're not his wealthy child or his broke child. You're not his educated child or his uneducated child. You are just his child. That's all it is in the eyes of God. America, a land of liberty and equality, is an idea that was shared with the world after it was revealed to our founding fathers. And it was on the truth of God's word that this nation was founded. Don't lose heart. We may not have a Washington or a Lincoln or a Reagan to lead us today, but we can still make a difference in America because we still have us. And as long as there is an us, there is hope for America. Amen. Despite our country's mistakes and despite her sins because of the flawed individuals who have led her, we still have much to be proud of as a Christian nation. A nation clearly founded on Christian principles by men who were believers or at the very least were God-fearing men. America has done much more good in the world than probably any other nation because we have taken the biblical mandate to use our freedom, as Paul said to, serve one another humbly and in love. I wonder this morning if there's somebody in your life, in your sphere of influence, that you can think of that you could say, you know what, Pastor Atkins, I could be serving that person I could be serving those people humbly and in love. I haven't always seen us as equals, but you know what? Now today I recognize that God sees us all the same, and I need to be serving humbly and in love. Despite those who demean our values and our heritage, we can all stand up for America one at a time if we have to, and do what we can to preserve these godly pillars that have meant so much to so many for so long. As I said, we do still have us. Listen, as the body of Christ, we're in this together, aren't we? We're the family of God. Whether you attend this church on a regular basis, whether you go to the Baptist church five hours from here, whether you just pop in here today, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that makes you our brother and our sister. That means we're from the same family. doesn't matter. And we're all in this together. And you're no better than I am, and your church is no better than my church, and my denomination is not any better than your denomination. In fact, God don't worry about any of that stuff. He just wants to see, has the blood of my son, Jesus Christ, been applied to your life? And if so, that brings us together. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we have us as believers, but we also have us as Americans.